kids are supposed to be innocent and carefree, right? But that wasn't the case for seven-year-old Amajit Sada, who brutally took the life of his eight-month-old sister simply because she was crying too much. Or even for Jasmine Richardson, whose idea of the perfect teenage romance began with taking the lives of her parents. Get ready to be shaken by these 15 terrifying young serial killers who'll make you rethink everything about childhood innocence. Amajit Sada in 2007, India earned a world record it never wanted, the youngest serial killer. At just seven years old, Amajit Sada had committed three brutal murders. Born in 1998 in the Musahaha village of Bihar, Amajit was the son of impoverished parents. A loner by nature, he spent his time climbing trees and roaming around his village. The birth of his baby sister added a burden to the family's already fragile resources. Amajit's parents left him in charge of his six-month-old cousin, the daughter of his maternal uncle. He started to pinch and slap the infant, and when she cried, he put his hands around her throat and choked her. He then took her to a nearby forest, bashed her head in, and buried her. When his mother returned, he smiled and took her to the body. His parents shielded him even after he confessed. His next victim was his eight-month-old sister. One afternoon, while his parents were sleeping, he strangled her. When his mother picked her up, she knew what had happened. When she asked Amajit if he had done it, he said yes. When asked why, he answered just like that. But again, his parents did not report him to the police. His final kill was in 2007, when he was eight years old. This time, it was a six month old baby girl named Kushbu. The baby's mother had left her daughter at a primary school but found that she was missing when she returned. After a few hours, Amajit confessed to killing her. He admitted that he strangled her, hit her with a brick, and buried her. He even led the villagers to the spot. When the police questioned him, Amajit was calm and composed, with no fear on his face. His nonchalance stunned the officers, but he eventually led them to where he buried his last victim and told them about his previous killings. Since he was a minor, he was sent to a juvenile home and kept in isolation. Doctors diagnosed him with a conduct disorder, saying he derived pleasure from harming others. They said he was born with a mental disorder that motivated him to commit murders. They believed his physical and mental illness could be cured through medication and therapy. When Amarjeet turned 18 in 2016, he was released under a new identity, and his whereabouts are now unknown. Cayetano Santos Godino Cayetano Santos Godino, also known as El Petiso Orejudo, or the Big-Eared Midget, was just 16 years old when he was declared insane and sent to a reformatory for the murder of four children and the attempted murder of seven others in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in the early 20th century. Born on October 31, 1896, Cayetano was one of eight or ten boys. His parents, Fiore Godino and Lucia Ruffo, were Italian immigrants and abusive alcoholics. His father had contracted syphilis before Cayetano was born causing the boy to suffer serious health issues as a child. He was also physically abused by his father and older brother, with doctors later finding 27 scars on his head. Cayetano displayed violent tendencies from a young age, killing cats and birds, and enjoying playing with fire. He also struggled in school due to a lack of interest and rebellious behavior. At age seven, he beat up a two-year-old and threw him into a ditch, but was let off with a trip to the police station. The following year, he attacked another child with a stone, but was released from jail due to his young age. At age 10, Cayetano was sent to jail for two months after his parents reported his compulsive masturbation to the police. After his release, he continued to display violent behavior, including arson and attempted murder. On December 3, 1912, he lured three-year-old Gesualdo Giordano away with the promise of sweets. He tried to strangle the boy, then beat him and hammered a nail into his skull, hiding the body before attending the wake and touching the skull where he had driven in the nail. He was arrested the next day and confessed to his crimes. Cayetano Cayetano was initially sent to a reformatory, but was later transferred to jail, and eventually, the Ushuaia Penitentiary. He continued to display violent behavior, including killing the inmates' pet cats and attacking other prisoners. He died in prison on November 15, 1944, under suspicious circumstances, possibly due to internal bleeding. His remains were never found, adding a final mysterious twist to this chilling case. Mary Bell Mary Bell was born on May 26, 1957, to Betty McCricket, a 16-year-old sex worker who reportedly told doctors to take that thing away from me when she saw her daughter. Things went downhill from there. McCricket was often away from home on business trips to Glasgow, but her absences were periods of respite for the young Mary, who was subject to mental and physical abuse when her mother was present. Given all that had happened, it did not surprise them that by age 10, Mary Bell had become a strange child, withdrawn and manipulative, always hovering on the edge of 
of violence, but there was a lot they didn't know. For weeks before her first murder, Mary Bell had been acting strangely. On May 11, 1968, Mary had been playing with a three-year-old boy when he was badly injured in a fall from the top of an air raid shelter. His parents thought it was an accident. The following day, three mothers came forward to tell police that Mary had attempted to choke their young daughters. A brief police interview and a lecture resulted, but no charges were filed. Then, a few months later, 11-year-old Mary Bell strangled four-year-old Martin Brown to death in an abandoned house in Newcastle, England. She then broke into a nursery with her friend, 13-year-old Norma, and left notes confessing to the murder. The police dismissed this as a prank. Two months later, Mary and Norma strangled three-year-old Brian Howe. Mary mutilated his body with scissors, scratching his thighs and partially skinning his genitals. She also returned to the scene to carve an M into his stomach with a razor blade. Mary's mother, Betty, was a prostitute who often left her daughter alone and tried to kill her on multiple occasions, feeding her pills as treats. From the age of four, Mary's mother forced her to engage in sexual acts with men. Mary was convicted of manslaughter in December 1968 and sentenced to life in prison. She was released in 1980 at the age of 23 and given a new identity. She gave birth to a daughter in 1984. Her daughter didn't know about her mother's past until 1998 when reporters discovered their location. Jasmine Richardson in April 2006, 12-year-old Jasmine Richardson and her 23-year-old boyfriend, Jeremy Steinke, found themselves at the center of a gruesome murder investigation. The bodies of three members of the Richardson family were discovered in their home in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada. The victims were Mark Richardson, his wife Deborah, and their 8-year-old son, Tyler Jacob. The couple's 12-year-old daughter, Jasmine, was missing. Initially, fears arose that Jasmine may have been abducted or fallen victim to the same fate as her family. However, the following day, she was located located 81 miles away in the community of Leda, Saskatchewan, with Steinke. Both were arrested and charged with the murders. The young couple's dark and twisted relationship had begun just months earlier when they met at a punk rock concert. Steinke, a high school dropout with a troubled past, claimed to be a 300-year-old werewolf and wore a vial of blood around his neck. He was on the website vampirefreaks.com, a goth social network. Once described as a happy and social girl, Jasmine soon became enamored with Steinke and the goth lifestyle. She wore dark makeup to appear older and adopted the online persona Runaway Devil. Friends of Steinke later revealed that he told them he liked the taste of blood. The Richardsons, understandably disturbed by their daughter's relationship with a man over twice her age, tried to put a stop to it. They grounded Jasmine and took away her computer, but the star-crossed lovers were determined to be together, no matter the cost. Jasmine laid out her chilling plan in a message to Steinke. I have this plan. It begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you. Steinke replied, well, I love your plan, but we need to get a little more creative with, like, details and stuff. On the night of the murders, the couple watched the film Natural Born Killers, a violent tale of a couple on a killing spree. The next day, they were seen laughing and kissing in a restaurant just two hours after committing the brutal acts. When police arrived at the Richardson home, they found a gruesome scene. Deborah and Mark had been stabbed to death in the basement, with Mark bearing 24 knife wounds and Deborah 12. Upstairs, little Tyler Jacob lay in his bed with his throat slashed, surrounded by blood-soaked toys. At first, Jasmine was not considered a suspect, but as evidence from her room and locker was uncovered, investigators realized the unthinkable. The 12-year-old girl had plotted the murders of her own family. In 2007, Jasmine was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to 10 years, the maximum allowed for a minor. She was released in 2016 and given a new identity. Steinke was also convicted of three counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole for 25 years. When asked why he did it, he replied, when you find your soulmate, you do anything for them. I did anything. Craig Price on the night of July 27, 1987, 13-year-old Craig Price committed his first murder. He broke into the home of his neighbor, 27-year-old Rebecca Spencer, took a knife from her kitchen, and brutally stabbed her 58 times. The brutality of the murder shocked the entire neighborhood, and despite efforts to find her killer, the case went cold. Two years later, on September 1, 1989, Price, high on marijuana and LSD, broke into another neighbor's home, this time belonging to the Heaton family. He stabbed 39-year-old Joan Heaton, 57 times, and her 10-year-old daughter Jennifer 62 times, and crushed the skull of her 7-year-old daughter Melissa, also inflicting 30 stab wounds. The stabbings were so violent that the knife handles broke off, leaving blades lodged in the victims' bodies. All of Price's victims were his neighbors, chosen after he had spied on them. He would break into their homes and stab them to death with their own kitchen knives, often stabbing them so deeply that the knives would break. His victims' bodies were left butchered, surrounded by massive pools of blood. The similarities between the crimes were struck 
striking, and the FBI was called in to profile a serial killer. They failed to identify a 15-year-old black male as their suspect. However, an observant detective noticed that Price had a large cut on his hand, leading to his arrest. When confronted, Price tried to excuse the cut on his hand as an injury from drunkenly punching a car window. However, the detectives weren't convinced and wrote up a report, deciding to investigate further. They soon discovered that Price had a history of offenses, including breaking and entering, theft, peeping into houses, and drug use. During questioning, Price was asked about the cut on his hand again. He stuck to his original story, but the detectives knew he was lying. They asked him to take a lie detector test, which he failed. A search warrant was obtained, and the police found bloody knives and clothing in his home. Confronted with this evidence, Price calmly confessed to the murders, even mimicking the dying sounds of the girls. He showed no remorse and bragged that he would make history when he was released, as he couldn't be tried as an adult due to his age. Ida Schell. Ida Schnell was just a young girl from Munich, barely a teenager, but she worked as a nursemaid, looking after babies. She seemed older than her years, but folks often thought she wasn't. Too bright. The strange thing was, wherever she went, the babies she cared for seemed to have a knack for dying. Nobody really connected the dots until after the sixth baby died while under her watch. They all passed away suddenly within six months of her taking care of them. Suspicion started to creep in after the sixth funeral. Eventually, they decided to dig up the body of the latest victim, a newborn son son of the Bickler family. The poor kid was just two weeks old when he died. What they found was horrifying. Someone had deliberately pierced the baby's soft skull with a sharp object, causing his death. Suddenly, all eyes turned to Ida Schnell. How could someone so young do such a thing? It was a shock to everyone. The authorities started to piece together the puzzle, and it wasn't long before they realized that the deaths of all those babies were no accidents. The truth was chilling. It seemed that wherever Ida went, tragedy followed. She moved from job to job, but the pattern remained the same. Innocent infants lost their lives under her care. Marcelo Pesagini in the early hours of Monday, August 5th, 2013, 13-year-old Marcelo Pesagini shot dead his parents, grandmother, and great-aunt in their home in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He then went to school, attended classes, and, after returning home, killed himself. Marcelo's father, Luis Pesagini, a 40-year-old police sergeant, was found dead in his bed. His mother, Andrea Pesagini, a 35-year-old police officer, was found on her knees in the bedroom. Marcelo's grandmother, Benedita de Oliveira Bovo, 65, and great-aunt, Bernadette Oliveira da Silva, 55, were found dead in their beds in a separate area of the house. All four victims were shot in the head. Marcelo was found dead with a gunshot wound to the head. His father's police issue revolver was found nearby, and a second gun was discovered in his school backpack. The chilling crime scene bore a striking resemblance to the infamous Amityville family massacre of 1974, in which Ronald DeFeo Jr. shot dead his parents, two brothers, and two sisters in their beds. Eight months before the murders, Marcelo had posted a picture linked to this killing spree on his Facebook page, leading investigators to believe that he was reenacting the notorious crime. According to his friends, Marcelo had expressed a desire to kill his parents and become a hitman. He had also formed a group called Mercenaries, which aimed to kill parents and corrupt politicians. Michael Hernandez Michael Hernandez was just 14 when he became obsessed with serial killers, spending his free time researching their horrific crimes and their lives. This fascination turned sinister when he decided he wanted to become one himself. On February 3rd, 2004, Hernandez armed himself with a knife, gloves, and an oversized jacket and set off to school, intending to begin his murderous spree. His first intended victim, a fellow student at Southwood Middle School in Palmetto Bay, Florida, refused his invitation to look at something in the boys' bathroom. Room. Undeterred, Hernandez approached his friend and classmate, 14-year-old Jamie Guff, with the same offer. Tragically, Jamie accepted, and once inside the bathroom, Hernandez attacked, stabbing Jamie a total of 42 times and then slitting his throat. Hernandez then returned to class as if nothing had happened, hiding the bloody knife in a hidden compartment of his backpack. However, a teacher noticed the blood on his hands, and soon after, the body of Jamie Guff was discovered. Hernandez was taken into custody, and his journal, containing a kill list with numerous names, including including his sisters, was found at his home. During his trial, Hernandez pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, but the court rejected this. He was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison in 2008. While incarcerated, he continued to display an interest in macabre subjects, including serial killers, death metal music, and violent movies. Despite his claims of remorse and attempts to portray himself as a changed man, a judge rejected his bid for early release in 2016, citing his continued fascination with violent subjects. 
Hernandez died in prison in April 2021 at the age of 31. His cause of death was ruled as cardiac dysrhythmia attributed to morbid obesity. While his death brought mixed emotions to those impacted by his crime, it also left unanswered questions and a chilling reminder of the darkness that once lurked within him. Pedro Rodriguez Filho Pedro Rodriguez Filho, known as Pedrinho Matador, or Killer Pete, was a Brazilian serial killer who exclusively targeted suspected criminals. His story is so notorious that it inspired the popular TV series Dexter, leading to his alternate moniker, the Brazilian Dexter. Born in 1954, Filho's life was marked by tragedy from the start. His skull was damaged before he was even born due to his father, physically abusing his pregnant mother. This set the tone for a childhood filled with violence, and at just 13, he attempted to kill his cousin by pushing him into a sugarcane press. He claimed he felt the urge to kill for the first time then. Filho's killing spree began when he was 14. He shot the deputy mayor of his hometown, Santa Rita do Sapucai, for firing his father, a school security guard. A month later, he killed another guard, whom he suspected was the real thief. After these murders, he fled to Sao Paulo, where he robbed drug dens and killed drug dealers, earning media attention as a vigilante. Filho's personal life was also filled with tragedy. His fiancée, Maria Aparecida Olympia was murdered by a gang leader while pregnant with his child. Enraged, he tracked down and killed the entire gang, including the leader. This was not the only time he took revenge on his loved one's killers. When his father murdered his mother, Filho killed his father in prison, stabbing him 22 times, ripping out his heart, and biting into it. Filho's murderous rampage continued behind bars. He killed 47 inmates, including a rapist he was being transported with, and a cellmate who spied on him during conjugal visits. Despite his gruesome crimes, he was released in 2007 after serving 34 years, as Brazilian law at the time prohibited anyone from spending more than 30 years in prison. Filho's newfound freedom was short-lived, as he was arrested again in 2011 and convicted of rioting and deprivation of liberty. He was released in 2018 after serving seven years. After his second release, he became a YouTuber, using his channel to speak out against crime and share his story. However, his life came to a violent end on March 5, 2023, when he was shot and killed by two unknown assailants. Carol Ann Fugate Carol Ann Fugate, born on July 30, 1943, in Lincoln, Nebraska, became the youngest female in U.S. history to be tried and convicted of first-degree murder. In 1958, when she was just 14, her boyfriend, 19-year-old Charles Starkweather, went on a killing spree, murdering 11 people, including Fugate's mother, stepfather, and two-year-old half-sister. Starkweather, a high school dropout, began his murderous rampage in December 1957, killing a gas station attendant. He then escalated, targeting Fugate's family on January 25, 1958. Over the next 48 hours, the couple's spree took seven more lives. Starkweather shot and stabbed victims, including a farmer, two teenagers, and a wealthy couple and their maid. Fugat claimed she was a hostage, terrified of what Starkweather would do to her family if she didn't obey. She alleged that she came home to find her family already murdered and that Starkweather told her they were being held hostage by his gang. She insisted she stayed with him to protect her loved ones. However, Starkweather later claimed she was a willing accomplice, even testifying against her. The couple's crime spree ended on January 29, 1958, when they were arrested in Wyoming. Starkweather was sentenced to death and executed in the electric chair on June 25, 1959. Fugate, on the other hand, was sentenced to life imprisonment. Despite her claims of innocence, she was convicted based on the testimony of Starkweather and the prosecution's argument that she had opportunities to escape. Fugate's role in the murders has been debated for decades. Some believe she was a victim herself, manipulated and traumatized by Starkweather. Other see her as an eager accomplice, even participating in some of the killings. The true nature of her involvement remains unclear, and she has consistently maintained her innocence. Fugate was granted parole in 1976 after serving 17 or 18 years in prison. She rebuilt her life, working as a medical technician and a janitorial assistant before retiring. She married in 2007, but tragedy struck again when her husband died in a car accident in 2013. Fugate has sought a pardon to clear her name, but it was denied in 2020 leaving her true role in the killings a matter of speculation. Alyssa Bustamante Alyssa Bustamante, born on January 28, 1994, in Cole County, Missouri, was just 15 when she brutally murdered her nine-year-old neighbor, Elizabeth Olton, on October 21, 2009. This shocking crime revealed a dark side to the seemingly ordinary teenage girl. On the surface, Bustamante appeared to be a typical teen. She wrote poems, joked around, and regularly attended the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, participating in youth activities. However, her online presence told a different story. On her MySpace profile, 
trial, she listed her hobbies as killing people and cutting. Bustamante had a troubled childhood with drug addict parents who were often absent. She was raised by her grandparents, who provided a stable home. However, Bustamante struggled with mental health issues, including severe depression, and had attempted suicide multiple times. She was on antidepressants and had received psychiatric care. On the day of the murder, Bustamante lured Alten into the woods, strangled her, slashed her throat, and stabbed her multiple times. She then buried the body in a grave she had dug a few days earlier. In her diary, Bustamante wrote about the killing, I just fucking killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them now they're dead. I don't know how to feel at the moment. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the oh my god, I can't do this feeling, it's pretty enjoyable. I'm kinda nervous and shaky though, right now. K, okay, I gotta go to church now. LOL. After the murder, Bustamante attended a church dance while the police searched for Alton. When confronted, she initially denied the crime, but later confessed and led the police to the grave. She was charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action. During the trial, Bustamante's defense attorneys highlighted her troubled childhood and mental health issues. However, she was tried as an adult, and in 2012, she accepted a plea deal, pleading guilty to second-degree murder and armed criminal action. She was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole, but her subsequent appeals were denied. Elizabeth Alton's mother, Patricia Price, called Bustamante a monster and sued her for wrongful death, eventually settling for $5 million. James Fairweather James Fairweather, born in 1999, became known as Britain's youngest serial killer when, at just 15, he brutally murdered two strangers in Colchester, Essex in 2014. His obsession with serial killers and his desire to emulate them led to a killing spree that shocked the nation. Fairweather's first victim was 33-year-old James Atfield, a father of five who had suffered a brain injury in a car crash. On March 29, 2014, Fairweather stabbed Atfield over 100 times in a brutal and relentless attack. Just three days earlier, Fairweather had received a referral order for a knife point robbery at a shop. Three months later, on June 17th, Fairweather struck again. This time, his victim was 31 year old Nahid Almanea, a Saudi Arabian student at the University of Essex. Fairweather stabbed her multiple times with a bayonet, including in both eyes, as she walked along a nature trail near her home. Fairweather's obsession with serial killers was evident. He was interested in the Yorkshire Ripper, Peter Sutcliffe, and considered Ted Bundy his favorite murderer. He also researched other notorious killers like Ian Huntley, Myra Hindley, and the Stockwell Strangler, Kenneth Erskine. His fascination extended to horror films and violent video games such as Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto. In May 2015, Fairweather was arrested while hunting for a third victim. He was spotted by a dog walker, hiding in the bushes near the spot where he had killed Almanea, wearing gloves and carrying a knife. He told the police, I'm waiting for someone to kill, I've done it twice before. During his trial, Fairweather admitted to manslaughter but denied murder, claiming diminished responsibility due to psychosis and voices compelling him to kill. However, a court psychiatrist cast doubt on his claims and he was found guilty of both murders. In April 2016, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 27 years. Cindy Collier and Shirley Wolfe Cindy Collier and Shirley Wolfe, aged 15 and 14 respectively, became known as teenage killers after they brutally murdered 85-year-old Anna Brackett in her home in Auburn, California on June 14, 1983. This case was even more shocking because the girls had only met each other the day before. Both Collier and Wolfe had troubled backgrounds marked by sexual abuse and family issues. Collier, a rebellious teenager with a history of shoplifting, bullying and carjacking, had been raped before her 10th birthday and harbored anger and resentment towards people she perceived as having normal lives. Wolf, on the other hand, had been sexually abused by her father and paternal grandfather from infancy. She had a disruptive childhood, running away from home at the age of six and moving from one foster home to another. On the day of the murder, the girls wanted to steal a car and leave town. They knew they couldn't overpower adults, so they decided to target an elderly person. They chose Brackett, a kind and helpful retired seamstress and great-grandmother who invited them into her home after they asked to use her phone. The girls chatted with Brackett for about an hour before they suddenly attacked, stabbing her at least 28 times. In her diary, Wolf wrote, Today, Cindy and I ran away and killed an old lady. It was lots of fun. Collier echoed similar sentiments in her confession, stating, We wanted to do another one. We just wanted to kill someone, just for fun. The girls were arrested within hours of the murder and tried as juveniles. They were found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to the maximum penalty for juveniles, imprisonment until their 25th birthday. Collier was released in 1992 and Wolf in 1995. 
1995. After their release, the two went their separate ways. Collier started a family in Northern California and has had no further encounters with the law. Wolf, on the other hand, had a more challenging time after her release, but eventually turned her life around. She has been using her life experience to help others deal with childhood abuse and abusive parents. David Brom David Brom, born on October 3, 1971, became one of America's youngest mass murderers when, at just 16, he killed his parents, brother, and sister with an axe in February 1988. This shocking crime, which took place in Rochester, Minnesota, revealed a dark side to the seemingly polite and gangly teenager. On the evening of February 18, 1988, the bodies of 43-year-old Bernard Brom, his 42-year-old wife Paulette, their 13-year-old daughter Diane, and 11-year-old son Richard were discovered in their home. All four victims had sustained numerous gashes to the head and upper body. The murder weapon, a blood-stained axe, was found in the basement. David and his older brother, Joe, were initially missing from the home, leading police to suspect a possible abduction. However, a friend of David's came forward, revealing that he had confessed to her, detailing how he had killed his family. David was captured the next day near the local post office. David's case was initially referred to the juvenile court system due to his age, but the severity of the crime resulted in his trial as an adult. His defense claimed insanity and mental illness illness became a focal point of the trial. On October 16, 1989, David was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to three consecutive life sentences with 52 years and six months before parole. The motive behind David's actions remains unclear. He had dyed his hair, shaved the sides, and spiked the back, and there were reports of trouble with his parents over the music he listened to. He had also made threats against his parents and his friends. Additionally, he had a history of suicide attempts and had been diagnosed with severe depression. The crime shocked the Rochester community and attracted national media attention due to the horrific violence, the young age of the perpetrator, and his mental health issues. The trial judge, who wept after sentencing, described the case as an extreme and monumental tragedy. David is currently serving his sentence at the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Stillwater. Harvey Miguel Robinson Harvey Miguel Robinson, born on December 6, 1974, became one of America's youngest serial killers when, at just 18, he embarked on a violent spree, murdering three women and injuring two others in under a year. Robinson, from Allentown, Pennsylvania, was no stranger to violence, with an alcoholic and abusive father who was later incarcerated for the brutal murder of his mistress. Robinson's troubles began early. He was first arrested at age nine and exhibited severe conduct disorder traits in school, including an inability to distinguish right from wrong and a strong distaste for authority. As he grew older, his threats and outbursts intensified, and both peers and authority figures began to fear him. In August 1992, Robinson began his killing spree. He raped and murdered 29-year-old Joan Berghardt, a nurse's aide in her home. A month later, he was arrested for burglary and served eight months in prison. After his release, he struck again, abducting and killing 15-year-old newspaper carrier Charlotte Schmoyer in June 1993. He raped and stabbed her over 20 times, slashing her throat. The following month, Robinson raped and strangled 47-year-old grandmother Jessica Jean Fortney. He also attacked a five-year-old girl, stalking her for days before breaking into her home, raping and choking her. Miraculously, she survived. Another survivor, Denise Sam Kelly, played a crucial role in Robinson's capture. After escaping his initial attack, she agreed to act as bait, leading to a shootout between Robinson and a police officer. He was eventually tracked down to a local hospital where he had sought treatment for his wounds. Robinson was convicted of the three murders and sentenced to death in in November 1994. However, due to the 2012 US Supreme Court ruling that deemed death sentences for juveniles unconstitutional, his sentence has been a subject of ongoing debate, with two of the three death sentences overturned. And there you have it, folks. 15 bone-chilling tales of young serial killers who thought the law didn't apply to them. For more fascinating videos like this, click on the cards on your screens. Until next time, stay safe out there.